just, um, I'm sorry I'm late, I've just had Parliament because there was a couple of statements on transport on business questions and um, I dashed out, gave my apologies and I said, um, I was coming down to PCS, I was coming down to the front. <laughs> the um, in Brighton front. I said, no, the class war front, comrade. <laughs> It was a Tory. I said, I'll come and review the troops. He hadn't got a clue. <laughs> well, there we are anyway. This is it, isn't it? This is it. We, this week you've made the most momentous decision in the history of this union. We're asking our members to come out in the greatest act of trade union solidarity for at least a generation. And we're up for it, aren't we? We're up for it. And we're up for it because there isn't a person in this hall, not a member of our union, whose job, whose pay, whose pension is not at risk. And disgracefully they even came for our members' redundancy pay. So the question is, what are we supposed to do? Just roll over and keep our heads down? Do nothing in the hope that it will go away? And let them sack our members, cut our wages, steal our pensions and privatise our jobs? Because you know, and you know in the debate this week, because it was said, if you do nothing now, they'll come back for more. They'll come back for more as the economy refuses to lift, and we go into maybe another recession, or certainly just scrape along the bottom of economic activity. Because that's what this is all about, and we know what it's about. Our members paying for an economic crisis caused by the greed of bankers and the connivance of subservient governments. Our members paid for the crisis they didn't cause with their jobs, the court paid for with their jobs, their wages and their pensions. And what really gets to me is the hypocrisy. Rich tossers like Cameron telling us we're all in it together. Uh. No, we're not. No, we're not. And Osborne telling us we all have to make sacrifices. I sit opposite these millionaires and I'm beginning to feel physical towards them. <laughs> I feel sometimes like a Bernadette Macalisky moment coming on me, but you just have to restrain yourself. With inflation at nearly 5%, a wage freeze for our members means a pay cut. And last week, as you know, it was revealed that the directors of the top companies averaged a pay rise of 45%. If you read the papers this morning, you'll see the figure at the top, the top 1,000 of the richest list gained last year an increase of their wealth of £60 billion. Pounds. The bankers' bonus is a bank. They're back to pre crisis levels of £6 billion or more. But they're fiddling the figures because what they're not giving themselves in bonuses, they're giving themselves in increases. <coughs> and what really got me what really got me is the banks that we bailed out, the ones that we nationalised, the ones that we now own, their directors paid themselves sizeable bonuses again this year. Apologies to my mum for my bad language, but that really is taking the piss, isn't it? <laughs> it really is. members are angry, but they're not alone. It's not just us that's angry. The scale of the economic crisis means that this attack is on the jobs and wages and pensions of every public service worker, and it has an echo in the private sector as well. Nobody, absolutely nobody but the super rich is secure. I was at the NUT conference, you could cut the atmosphere of anger with a knife. But alongside that anger was the same determination that has been displayed at this conference. I'm speaking at the UCU in a fortnight where I've marched alongside their executive and been on every demonstration and their picket lines. And their anger and their determination is the same. People have had enough. They've had enough of being pushed around. They've had enough of being the scapegoats for this recession. Time and time again people are using the same phrase, we're not taking it anymore. I was at the POA conference a fortnight ago. Exactly the same. Anger as their jobs, their prisons are being threatened with privatisation. At the FBU in London, 
where there was the strike and absolutely solid as a strike. And then at this week's conference as the firefighters' pensions have been threatened, the same anger and determination. And yesterday, even the Police Federation, even the Police Federation, giving Theresa May a hard time. I have got a question though. What happens when undercover police officers take industrial action? <laughs> <laughs> The result of the anger and determination is that we're facing the potential of the largest trade union mobilisation in at least a generation. Not entering it, none of us are entering into this lightly. Nobody does. It's after months of futile negotiations and government statements that are seeking to provoke our members. But it's the only way we can demonstrate to this government that we're serious and we're not willing to be treated in this way. The only way to force them to negotiate in table and enter into serious negotiations. But it's not just trade unionists that are saying this. And it's not just trade unionists taking action. This coalition government is taking on virtually the whole community. And we're seeing the whole community mobilise. It started, as others have said, it started with the students. I was on the march of the NUSBC organised in November to expect the 20,000 or 50,000 turned up. And in Millbank, yes, there were a few windows smashed. <laughs> the youngsters who smashed those windows aren't the criminals. The criminals are the ministers who are actually destroying the futures of those students, the potential they have to fulfil. Ed, Ed Woodward was that student who very stupidly threw a fire extinguisher off the roof. Stupid and dangerous. So I have to say this, he didn't deserve to be made an example of with a three year sentence. Not three years. <laughs> UK Uncut, we've supported as a union and I've supported a put down motions on your behalf in Parliament to support them. For years, as a union, we've campaigned for tax justice and gained very little publicity, to be frank. UK Uncut come along, occupy a few shops and force the issue into the media and at the top of the agenda. And I support the UK Up campaigners who occupy Fortnum and Mesa's that symbol of inequality. I deeply regret that a single chocolate rabbit was damaged in the office. <laughs> There are always con casualties in conflict. <laughs> it's called chocolateral damage. Oh. <laughs> the <laughs> I have all the other campaigns that have emerged and mobilised. Black Triangle, the people with disabilities that have started ATOS, the company that's profiteering at the expense of some of the most vulnerable in our society. I was on the hardest hit march. It was the most wonderful display of solidarity I've seen in years. Incredibly moving. People with disabilities, a wide range of disabilities, coming from all over the country, some of them overcoming their problems with mobility to show their anger and solidarity. There was a group there, a group wearing t-shirts who suffered from Tourette's. It's a dreadful condition. It can really impede people's lives and it causes distress. As you know, it's a sy syndrome whereby people unexpectedly and without control can trap out profanities and obscenities. It's a terrible condition and no one should make little of it. But one of them said, sometimes you know it comes in handy when you're lobbying your feet. <laughs> <laughs> Other groups have effectively mobilised, barracks for mobilising black people in resistance. The women's movement is revived and on the march again yeah. at the effects of cuts fall disproportionately on women. And to be honest, if Ken Clark doesn't shut up, I'll be joining a slot walk myself. <laughs> the LGTB community has been mobilised and organising groups again explaining the impact on services right away across the country. And do you know the TUC's march was a major success. It wasn't half a million, was it? It was easily a million. 
I was pleased that Ed Miliband spoke on the platform in Hyde Park, and I'm pleased that they're going to speak at the Durham Miners Gala. But the message, though, the message is this. Real solidarity, real solidarity is actually being on that march. And real solidarity will be being on our picket lines. That what's, is what we're asking of them. Yeah, yeah. I don't want this to go to Mark's head, but Mark's speech in Hyde Park was brilliant. Exactly what was needed. It was truly inspirational. It's a pity it failed to inspire his Cardiff City players, but there's a... <laughs> Up, <laughs> <laughs> I think people are increasingly angry, they're mobilising because like us they begin to appreciate what this government is now doing and let me just focus on the parliamentary side of this because week by week what we're seeing is the coalition effectively dismantling of the welfare state brick by brick. It's wiping off the face of the earth all those gains that we fought for as a trade union movement over the centuries. It's worth reminding people how the welfare state was created. Alistair Darling said something before he went to his chancellor about the only thing I agreed with him. Because he said this recession is just like the 1930s. It's on the same scale. The people remember their history. We need to remind people their history. In the 1930s, there was a recession that was caused by bankers and speculators. We had coincidentally a coalition government, the Ramsey MacDonald government. The Ramsey MacDonald tried to save that recession by cutting public expenditure and cutting benefits, unemployment benefits in particular. And as a result, it turned the recession into a depression. And for a decade, we had high levels of unemployment and poverty on a, and deprivation on a scale which eventually led in some countries to fascism and then world war. The active government came about and us, as a class, we said never again. And we constructed the welfare state. The Tories never supported it. In fact, they hated it. And week by week now, they're using the economic crisis as the excuse to dismantle it. The first element of the welfare state was housing, putting a decent roof over people's heads. My dad was a doctor, my mum a cleaner. We lived in a house, a private landed, private rented house off Scotland Road in Liverpool. Um, I read some sociological studies that say one of the worst slums in Europe, we just used to call it home. But um, <laughs> I remember the day when we moved out into our council prefab and then the celebration that we had, we moved into a brick built council house, Parker Morris Standards. After the localism bill went through Parliament yesterday, all councils now have been given the discretion to end council tenancies for all new tenants. From here on in, Councils will only allow people on two or five year tenancies. And after that, if they earn above the wages that the council thinks they should earn, they'll be asked to leave their accommodation. Or if their children grow up and they've got extra space, they'll be asked to leave their accommodation. On Monday, I was at an eviction, trying to prevent the person being evicted in my constituency because a landlord wanted to kick her out so they could increase the rent to someone else. That's what's happening in this country. Yesterday was the day, May the 18th, was the day council house ended in this country as a result. And they're cutting housing benefits so that people can't afford the rents and social cleansing of most of our inner city areas alongside a 60% cut in ed housing funding. So housing's gone. Education bill has gone through. The abolition of the educational maintenance allowance, 9,000 fees, then transforms education from a gift from one generation to another into a commodity that can be bought and sold. And you saw only a few weeks ago they tried to get through the system disgustingly, the ability for rich families to buy their kids into universities. On pensions and benefits, well you know better than I. The move from RTI to CPI is cutting our benefits and cutting our pensions. The abuse of people on, with disabilities as a result of ASOS assessments is driving people into poverty. The other arm of the welfare state we constructed in the 40s was employment, the concept of full employment. Governments committed to creating full employment. We've now got 2.5 million unemployed, 1 million young people, but 1.7 million people forced into short-term work. I suppose one of the arms of the welfare state as well was rights. 
we had rights, trade union rights. We had the right to go to court as well. The governments now, and it was repeated again yesterday, are looking at another raft of anti-trade union legislation, banning some strikes in certain areas, but at the same time increasing the threshold for industrial action ballots. A threshold which only 35%, 35 MPs in Parliament would have been elected on at the last election. But also it's about it's about ending people's right to access to courts. A month ago, they cut legal aid. That's the scale of the attack on us, our people. And I think our job now is to expose that. Because people are gradually waking up to it, and when they do, they begin to resist. Anti-cuts campaigns right away across the country. Every time we call a demonstration, thousands of people turning out. Union after union now saying, enough's enough and that we need to take industrial action. But union after union now, saying if we are going to take industrial action, it's better if we do it together. But this government is edgy. It was edgy enough when it saw the demonstrations. That's why there's been a crackdown by the police, and that's why there was the catching, the use of patterns, and the arrests. But their biggest fear is if the direct action demonstrations are actually joined by industrial action. And that's what's happened. And I tell you, this government is unstable. You've seen the split that have already occurred. God knows what a cabinet meeting is like. Cameron's got Lampy sitting in the corner, thinking he's being set up on the NHS reforms. Who can to his penalty points? <laughs> Cable's trying to find out who set him up with the telegraph. And I don't want to mention Clark. But they're all looking at Osborne because they suspect what we know, that his sons don't add up and they're in economic crisis by the end of the year. But this is <coughs> a crisis. And I think what we have to do is where they now show weakness, where they show a lack of resolve, we need to show strength and determination. And when we have done, and when we've mobilised, yes, we've pushed them back, not all the way, but we've pushed them back, whether it's the Forestry Commission or today the Coast Guard Service or any other area where we've been able to demonstrate our ability to mobilise, we've been relatively successful. So I just say this to you now, our job is straightforward. We've got to resist. We've got to resist, not just on behalf of our members, but on behalf of our own community. And I ask you this, and I know you will, I want you to be strong. I want you to be determined. I want you to be convinced that we're doing the right thing. But above all, I want you to believe. I want you to believe that we can win. And we can win through solidarity. Campaigning together, marching together, coming out together. Solidarity.
Probably went to the PCS room. Yeah. Did you see the order forms? No. They're talking about Johnny, welcome to today's sort of function card. This is today's uh, interview debate.